Hi, I'm David Penn, Research Analyst with Finnovate. We're here at Finnovate Europe 2023 in London, England. Joining me is Chris Skinner, renowned financial services and fintech expert and CEO of The Financer. Great to see you again, Chris. And you, sir. Yes. I thought we'd talk about a couple of things today. Uh, you gave an impromptu uh, special address on the situation with Silicon Valley Bank. I thought we might touch on that, as well as your planned uh, address on the metaverse and financial services, which I thought was very interesting uh, later on this afternoon that we got to hear. Yeah. I'm glad you were there. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> so let's go start with the Silicon Valley Bank situation. In terms of maybe your top takeaways from that, some of the things in your remarks that you think people might want to keep in mind, what would you suggest? I think the primary thing is that SVB, which is the short term mm -hmm. Silicon Valley Bank, saw this explosion of deposits over the past three years going from just over 60 billion in 2019 to almost 200 billion in 2022. Mm -hmm. And instead of keeping a lot of liquidity, as in cash, they invested it in long-term yield products of government bonds and mortgage-backed securities, mm -hmm. which we call um, held to market, as in you've got to hold them until mm. they mature. Mm -hmm. um, hold to maturity, HTM. Um, and if the mortgage securities, for example, are 10 years before they can be liquidated. Right. And so when they got a run on the bank, which actually was fueled by social media coming from Peter Thiel's Founders Fund, mm -hmm. and Peter Thiel's very influential, a bit like Elon Musk in, right. in, in this area, um, and I came from the same stable, PayPal, mm -hmm. um, okay. then all the venture capital funds and all the people who were, de have deposits with the banks said, can we have them back? Mm -hmm. And the, basically a run on the bank. Right. And um, it ended up last week um, that they said, look, we've cashed in our available funds, $1.8 billion. Um, we need another two, two, two to two and a half billion dollars mm. to get through through this. And everyone said no. Mm. And that's when the whole thing imploded. There's lots more to it and it's quite complicated, but the key takeaway for me is um, always make sure you have enough cash in the bank to pay the customer if they ask for it back. Yeah, well, that was one of the things I really found fascinating about what you said, and especially at a conference like this where there's so many interesting uh, lights and bells and whistles going on, that you seem to say that at root it was just a basic fault of, of not understanding how banking works. And I think that yeah. was really something that might have rippled through the entire audience of, yeah, at the end of the day, you're either a good bank or you're not. And if you're not a good bank, bad things are likely to happen. Yeah, I mean, the core of banking, the basics, is mm -hmm. that you borrow, mm -hmm. as in you get cash in from depositors, and you lend. Right. And the aim is to obviously lend at a much higher percentage interest rate than what you're getting on your deposits, which mm -hmm. is why savings are always lower than right. um, you know, loans and credit. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fundamental mistake is they tie themselves into this illiquid funding mm -hmm. because they, they, they made a bet. And the basic bet was that the Fed would not raise interest rates. Yes. And when the Fed did, those long-term products that they have to hold to maturity were making losses mm -hmm. and there's a lo load more in there but they, they just messed up the basics of banking yeah yeah that was really something i found really really interesting and among some of the folks that i know who are for example on our team who are still getting to understand the space a little bit uh whenever it was explained in those terms there was always the light bulb that would go off they would try to understand this and it would just yeah. be too confusing but when it came down to those basics it was like oh my goodness of course and they were able to understand it so well, that was well, really I've, I've had this thing recently so mm -hmm. you know I, I, fortunately or unfortunately i'm a hodler <laughs> um, as in I hold my cryptocurrency, I didn't right. sell it. And so it went down like 80% in the last year or mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, but I'm still okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not complaining. <laughs> um, but I've got two little boys and their school fees are you know, beyond immense. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh. So suddenly I've got to get thousands of pounds, dollars of liquidity right, right. to cover the school fees. Now I'm lucky because I can do that with crypto. But if I didn't have that, mm then I don't know what I'd do. Right, right. Really, really interesting. Um, let's talk a little about the other uh, address that you gave just, uh, just a few moments ago, actually, on the metaverse. Um, there were quite a few discussions about the metaverse. I thought that yours brought some new things to the table that weren't discussed earlier as, as well, um, uh, urging a certain level of patience, which I thought was sort of good uh, for people to get to understand it. Could you give us some of the main takeaways from that presentation that you think that people should keep in mind? Well, that, the main thing is the idea of the metaverse is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And the technologies that we now have in play from 5G through to artificial intelligence um, through to cryptocurrencies, because mm -hmm. you'll need to have money in the metaverse, right. um, are all playing towards building an augmented virtual world that we could step into, mm -hmm. like the holodeck on the Star Trek 
next generation. Right. Um, so effectively, you, you open the door and you're suddenly all five or six senses, if you have one, um, <laughs> are alert to a completely different world. Mm -hmm. um, but my main message was twofold. One is um, when you, well, actually it's threefold. You, we just seen Mark Zuckerberg walk away from the metaverse, yeah. um, having invested and lost $24 billion in the last two years in trying to build it. Mm -hmm because it's not easy. It's, it's, it's not ready for prime time, in my view. It, it's, it, it, will, it will be, mm -hmm. but not right now. Because right. if someone like Mark Zuckerberg can't make it work, then who will? Right. Um, secondly, that when we've tried this before, and we have tried it before with Second Life in the mm -hmm. 2000s, yeah. um, Second Life failed because they didn't have a regulation of their financial system. Mm -hmm. uh, Ginkgo Bank went bankrupt. Or actually, it didn't go bankrupt. It just got deleted. <laughs> um, the guy who created the bank in Second Life just walked away the money, um, and all the users were going, "Where's our money?" And mm. the guys who created it said, "Well, it's not our problem. It's your problem." Right. Um, and it ended up that they said, "Well, if you're going to be a bank in Second Life, you've got to be a bank in real life." Mm. And that, to me, is a critical point in the metaverse that there will be banks and financial uh, providers. Mm -hmm but they have to be regulated. And it's exactly the same as with cryptocurrency, like Silicon Valley Bank and others. Mm -hmm. <coughs> if you're covered by the Federal Deposit Insurance Compensation Scheme or the Bank of England's uh, regulators or the European Central Bank or whoever, mm -hmm. they give you a guarantee that you won't lose more than this amount of money right. in that bank. Mm -hmm. $250,000 under the FDIC in the States, mm -hmm. 85,000 pounds here. Um, which, which is not enough for a corporate or, right. or a, a, a startup tech company that's doing quite well. Mm -hmm. But having said that, at least there's something. Right. And one of the biggest issues for me with crypto has all along been, like with the FTX, for example, or Terra Luna or Mt. Gox going back years yeah. ago, mm -hmm. that um, who can you call if they go bust? Yeah. And how do I get my crypto funds back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, big time. I wonder if you find that uh, though very different uh, in terms of the sort of the epicness of what happened with crypto compared to the relatively mild uh, retreat, so to speak, of what happened with, with the metaverse. If there's something similar in the potential for both of them to sort of uh, go into a bit of hibernation from a certain perspective uh, that will allow blockchain to sort of emerge from the shadow of, of digital assets and Bitcoin and Ethereum, do you think something similar might be the case with, uh, with the metaverse that now that Mark Zuckerberg's pulled away from it, nobody's eyes are on it, it might actually provide the opportunity for some sort of quiet work that might eventually lead to the metaverse we hoped would happen? I mean, to me, it's kind of intuitive technologies. Mm. So intuitively, I can see the blockchain has use cases that would be amazing. Right. And yet I can't name one successful use case today that's in prime time production. Right. Um, most of them are very niche. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, my favorite ones are in China, ah. um, where they have more patents than any other country in the world. Right. Um, and I think the same will happen with the metaverse, that we're going to see a lot of development over time mm. and a lot of failures because it, you have to wait for prime time. Mm -hmm. but, and I, I, I'll give you an illustrative example of my own. In the, I used to work for NCR, the cash machine company. Yes, yes. Um, and they had biometric ATMs in the 1990s huh. in mm. test usage in branches of banks. Okay. And it didn't take off. Partly, mm. partly because the technology was not ready for main market usage mm. and partly because customers didn't like to have to stick their eyeball into the ATM. <laughs> <laughs> it was using iris recognition technology. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And yet now, you know, all of us are very happy using Face ID for payments on you know, our wallets on right. our mobile phones mm -hmm. because the technology has moved to the level now where it makes sense. And, mm. and it's not the technology it's the ease of use mm. and the convenience. Right. So during the pandemic, I moved very quickly towards using mobile wallets. I didn't mm. use them before because I didn't want to carry around cash. Right. And I was using Face ID uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's that convenience, ease of use, technology ready to be prime time that you know, is why biometrics is now accepted. Whereas even 10 years ago, it, was, it wasn't ready for mainstream. Yeah. And the same with blockchain. I said blockchain technologies will be sometime around 2025 or after. Mm -hmm. But I said that eight years ago. Because <laughs> basically I could see it's, it's not a technology. It's actually, when you look at the use cases, lots of people have to agree that that's the right thing to do. Yeah. 
uh, from different constituencies, from corporates to banks to governments to users and citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, and the metaverse is, is similar. I mean, I, I think it is getting there. Yeah. But I referenced Second Life in my presentation. That was 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. And now we're in 2023. <laughs> and there still isn't a metaverse or a Second Life right. that's actually in prime time production. There will be one. Mm -hmm. It's just when. Yeah, absolutely. It's so funny you bring up with the biometrics. I remember working at a company in, must have been around 2004 or five, and they decided at one point that to make it easier to, to do time cards and tracking, they would use a fingerprint uh, type of uh, biometric. And uh, this is a very mild-mannered office, family office, everybody knew each other, but the revolt <laughs> from these mild-mannered folks at the idea of this fingerprint, and, and they had all sorts of thoughts or whatever, and the, the owner couldn't understand it, but we're all one big family, it's just a technological thing, what's the problem? People, like you said, it wasn't the right thing for them just yet. Um, yeah. I don't know if, they, if, they've, if they've changed, but you're right. You can have these technologies available, but if the people are not ready for them, then they're just not going to reach that adoption that you need to make things really accelerate. Uh, it's a total aside, so I don't know whether you want to include it, but hmm. again, when I was in NCR, they started testing fingerprint recognition ATMs in Brazil, huh. and gunmen would walk you to the ATM with a gun at your head, and if you didn't take out the money, cut your hand off. Okay, great. So th then they started using um, vein technologies to recognize mm -hmm. whether you, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you, your hand was really on, on your arm. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Good grief. Well, let's talk a little bit about, so by way of wrapping up, um, other trends perhaps, either trends that maybe aren't being talked about as much that you kind of think would be really uh, things that people should be keeping an eye on, or if they're trends that you sort of see surfacing that people are excited about that you're maybe not 100% sold on just yet. Well, it tends to be, because I write books every couple of years, mm -hmm. uh, that I pick up on the themes that I'm hearing around the world and the industry. Right. And so my last one, Digital for Good, was about ESG, mm -hmm. environmental social governance, and how technology and finance can make the world a better place. And mm -hmm. I still think that's quite a big topic, but yeah. it's not popular in some countries, like what well, your accent relates to. Mm -hmm. um, and the next book I'm writing right now is around centralized versus decentralized finance and the friction mm -hmm. between central bank digital currencies and cryptocurrencies. Right. And again, it relates to everything I've just, we've just been talking about, which is I believe there'll be a hybrid finance, mm -hmm. which will say we can decentralize everything. Yeah. And you can own it. You can have your own pod on the internet, which is you know, your data owned by you, untouchable by anybody else, unless you allow them to see it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you lose money as data, mm -hmm. then here's the, the number to call. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so it will have some coverage in a scheme in a regulated bank, for example, for mon money as data. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I mean by hi-fi. It, it is decentralized, but there's going to be some backing behind it that's regulated. Yeah. Um, not necessarily by the, the Fed, though, or, right. Or, right. By, or, or by the Bank of England. Yeah. And this is what I'm toying with in the book. And this is what I find very exciting, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, if, if you end up with something that's regulated and decentralized, mm -hmm. who is the regulator? Who is the government? Mm. And the government could be the network of the citizens of the world. Because hmm. the technology is available to do that. Right. Huh. Uh, and that's exactly what crypto is all about. Right, right. But can you decentralize regulation? Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. That's, I was having a conversation uh, last night with somebody who came up to me, and that was exactly his issue. It's like you have these, these CDCs on the one side, the government uh, currencies, but then you've got cryptocurrencies. Like, isn't that sort of fundamentally at odds? And uh, I didn't really have a really good answer for him. Um, but your uh, sort of theory of hybrid finance, I think, really does solve it. At least it conceptually solves that problem. The work has to be done. But in terms of trying to square that circle, it seems like the most, it seems like what has to happen. You talk about intuitive. It yeah. seems like that's how it has to work out it's just a matter of how it works it, out. it's basically what stable coins are mm, um, okay. and it's stable coins give you crypto decentralized but tied to a basket of currencies are fiat government issued cbdc style currencies mm -hmm. um and I'm, I'm i'm okay with that yeah you know um and particularly because in the network of citizens you know when i'm online i don't recognize that i'm in poland or Right. You know, England or America, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on the global network. Right, right. Yeah, and that's why I, I refer to the global network as citizens. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Well, fantastic talking with you. Um, you we could talk all day, quite frankly, a lot of interesting things. Uh, the ESG, we're seeing a lot of demos here at Finnovate where you're starting to see companies try to figure out ways to make it easier for banks and institutions to, to um, make the sort of characterizations they want to make within the category. Um, some of those were, were on display today. So again, a lot of things we could talk about. Really great to sit down and talk with you a little bit today. I hope folks have enjoyed the conversation as well. Cheers, Cheers. my friend. Cheers to you. And cheers to you.